Welcome to the session um, called Building Interactive Web Apps Using the JavaScript API's Geometry Engine. By way of introduction, my name is Christian Ekenes. I'm a product engineer on the JavaScript API. I've, uh, I work on documentation, I build samples, I uh, help, uh, one of my principal projects is visualization, the renderers, smart mapping, and I also help out with Geometry Engine and Arcade. Uh, my name's uh, Dave Bayer. I also work in the um, JavaScript team. Um, I've worked a bit on the integration of the Geometry Engine into uh, uh, version 3 and version 4 of the API. So. All right, so I'm just going to go over some, a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. Um, Geometry Engine, it's a, it's a big topic, so we're going to, it might feel like we're breezing through, but we, we want to hit on a lot of topics. Um, so we're going to give an overview of what uh, the Geometry Engine is and what you have available to you. We're going to go through some code. How, does, how do you um, use those methods in your apps? And then we're going to get a little deeper, and we're going to talk about the internals of the Geometry Engine and uh, what you can do with it there. Uh, we're going to talk about the async architecture. There's two different uh, modules or objects available to you. You have a synchronous version of the Geometry Engine and an async version. We'll talk about when you might want to use one versus the other. And uh, then we're going to close up by uh, talking about when uh, the Geometry Engine will actually make a difference in your app and whether to use that or some other methods, maybe Geometry Service or, or something else. So what is the Geometry Engine? It it's, is what it sounds like. It's an engine for working with geometries in the API. What is cool about Geometry Engine is that it's client side. Uh, it's very similar to Geometry Service. Um, the, there's a couple of differences. The main difference being that uh, Geometry Service uh, uses uh, a service. You send uh, geometries uh, to the server and it processes them and you get something back. Geometry Engine it all works on the client and it deals principally with geometries. And geometry is one of those fundamental uh, core concepts of GIS. We're talking about points, lines, and polygons. Um, geometry Engine helps us understand um, relationships with uh, Ge with one geometry versus another, or another set of geometries. Uh, helps us understand measurements, how big is it, and, uh, and maybe the intersections or overlays. So we're going to go through um, the methods available to you in Geometry Engine, um, and then we'll just shower, with, shower you with a bunch of demos and show you uh, some of the things you can do with it. So we're going to break up these methods into three groups. Um, the first group is probably my favorite. It uh, allows you to test geometric relationships. And uh, so some of those might be uh, overlap. So does ge geometry A overlap geometry B? Is it within um, another geometry? Does one geometry cross another? Does it intersect it? Or when I grab a geometry, is it exactly equal with another geometry? And when we talk about equal, it may not be exactly equal because you can work with spatial tolerance, and Dave will talk about that a little later. And then there's also a touches function. And the reason I like these methods so much is because it just gives you a Boolean value back. Does it touch or does it not? And you can actually do a whole lot with that information without doing any complex uh, processing. Um, then there's also overlay operations. This is where it gets a little more complex, uh, and uh, we sometimes call it geometry al algebra. I like to call them overlay operations. So you can take two polygons and union them together to make a bigger polygon. You can take the symmetric difference of two polygons. So you want to return the polygon areas of two polygons where they do not intersect. Um, then you can use clip, which acts kind of like a cookie cutter. Like I want to keep geometry A, but I only want to keep what is within geometry B. And then, um, there, of course, there's intersect as well, which um, acts very similar. But um, if you have, say, a, a multi-part polygon, you get, you get those two parts back. And then there are these other methods which deal with uh, uh, topological correctness. So simplify and is simple. Um, when you're, one of the use cases for Geometry Engine, actually the primary use case it was, that drove the development of the Geometry Engine were editing workflows. So 
Um, a lot of times you might create an app, an editing app on the web, and you have users who create bad geometries. It happens all the time. Um, they might draw a polygon the wrong direction, or they might uh, have self-intersecting lines, um, and same with polylines. And what you can do is you can simplify those polygons. So instead of having those self-intersections, you can uh, pass it through a simplify function, and it will break up the polygon into separate rings, and or the polyline, it might break it up into different paths. Um, if that geometry is indeed valid. So you can configure your own logic to say, oh, well, this is valid, it, it looks awful, but we can still pass it on to our server. But before we do, we want to make sure it is a correct geometry. And so, like I said, with the editing workflows, um, you, users are uh, used to things such as snapping. So you can use the nearest vertices and nearest coordinates functions to snap the location of the mouse cursor to the edge of a geometry. So the vertice will snap to the nearest vertice, and the nearest coordinate will go to some other place along the line or the path. And again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through and we're going to demo like, how this works. So this is the last category um, of functions, and that's uh, distances and measurements. So you have uh, two, there's two flavors of each of these. So you have length, you have area, you also have buffering. Um, you have a planar version and a geodesic version. Uh, planar is, um, is what it sounds like. You take the distance um, the, on an assumed flat surface and you want to get the shortest distance or the length or the actual length of the line in that case. Uh, or in the geodesic, it assumes the curvature of the earth and you get that line back. And we're going to talk about when you might use one versus the other, because there are use cases for both. And the same is true of, of buffering. Um, you can uh, create buffers around points, lines, or polygons, and use those for visualization. You can use it for analysis. Um, uh, or, again, you can also use it for editing. And I believe Dave's app that he'll demo for editing uses buffer in an editing workflow. And then you have these other operations available to you. Um, just an interesting fact, uh, so you see that image down on the bottom. Uh, it looks a little odd. You have a red line that sticks through the globe, and then the green line that connects the two same points across the top of the globe. Uh, when we first released version 4.0 of the API, one of the most common bugs users would, would report would be something along these lines. They would click a point on one side of the globe, click another point, and try to construct a polyline. And the spatial reference of that polyline is Web Mercator, which is a projected coordinate system. And that line would go straight through the Earth like that. And they'd say, oh, there's a bug with your API. It's not working. I'm trying to get a line that follows this curvature along this Z value I'm passing in, and it's not doing it. It's, it's going through the Earth. And in reality, um, that is by design, actually. And that's because the line they're passing only has two vertices, and there's nothing else in between. And so because we have that spatial reference, it's just assuming a flat plane, and it's trying to get the shortest distance between those two points, or the shortest path. Um, what, that, what those users needed to do, and what you need to do in this situation if you're trying to do something similar, is you need to densify that line. And there's a, a densify function. There's also a geodesic densify. You're going to use the geodesic densify, and that will create those other, uh, another set of vertices. You can set the uh, tolerance and the distance of those, and it will create that geodesic version for you. Um, you can also generalize, um, uh, calculate convex hull, rotate, flip. You can do all sorts of things uh, with the geometry engine. So with all that said, let's go ahead and look at some demos. So um, here I have a pretty straightforward editing app. I have a polygon um, that represents an area, and this, this is a relatively small area, 19 acres, um, nothing really big or huge. This is actually a location, um, an apple orchard area not far from where I grew up in eastern Washington, where we used to go pick apples. And let's say you have an editing application where you want to create apple orchard parcels or um, allow users to, to create uh, polygons, and then you want to send them back to your server and save those edits. So um, you'll notice that these apps use both the 3x and 4x versions of the API. Um, 
you might ask, well, why are you using 3x if you're focusing most of your development on 4? And the reason is because 3 isn't at full parity with 4 yet. But as far as Geometry Engine is concerned, it is at full parity. Um, the APIs for Geometry Engine in each version are exactly the same. So no matter what um, version you're using, the code snippets will look exactly the same. Um, so like I said, the, my favorite functions are those test functions. I want to know geometric relationships. So what's cool about Geometry Engine is you can set up topology rules. And you do that on an app-by-app -app basis using Geometry Engine. So let's say I have this, this tool selected, cut features, and I select this polygon. And I wanna, want to allow the user to, to create a cut. So I'm going to draw this line. And then once I cross the polygon, I'm going to calculate areas of those cut features. And you can see that this is actually a really responsive app. Like I can get immediate feedback as, as to the areas of those features. I can see kind of this uh, offset dashed line around each feature to make it look like that there's a cut operation going on and it's not finished yet. And then I can double click and finish the cut. Um, there's a lot going on in just what I demoed right there. And let me uh, talk you through it again, again um, right now. So when I select a feature, I am making two calls to the geometry engine on every single mouse move. Can you imagine what that would do to the performance of your app if I were calling a service for that? It would break the app, basically. It would freeze your browser. Um, so every time I, I'm doing a mouse move, I'm making two calls. One of those is the isDisjoint function. That's basically the opposite of an intersection. I want to know where the mouse is in relation to that selected polygon. Right now, it is. The, that function returns true. It is disjoint. When I'm inside the polygon, it's not true. It's intersecting. And then I also want to know when after I make a click, sorry, that, uh, that's actually going on after I make a mouse click. So after I make the mouse click, I want to know if that line crosses the polygon. So in this case, the line is crossing the polygon, but the mouse is disjoint with the polygon. So if this makes sense, the, I want to perform a cut only when the line is crossing and when the mouse is outside the polygon. I don't want to attempt a cut operation in any other scenario. It doesn't make sense to attempt a cut here because there's no overlap. I don't want to attempt it here because it's not completely crossing. And once those two return true, I can perform my cut. And so I perform the cut, I get two geometries back, and then I'm doing um, some other operations. I'm calculating two offsets for each polygon I get back, and I'm calculating the area of those two polygons that I get back. And again, that's basically six operations on every mouse move. So it performs pretty well. So that's awesome. OK. So there's also a merge function. Um, if I uh, select a polygon, I want to be able to merge it with another one. But then I can set it up to where, you know, if I if the click is, if the polygon I click is equal with the polygon I select, then I don't want to do anything. I want to deselect it. So that's, that's what's going on here. If I click it again and then it's not equal, it'll perform the merge operation. But this is also a cool feature. So let's say that you have to have topological correctness when you add uh, features. So um, let's say I want to add this polygon down here, but I want to make sure that it, it borders uh, the existing polygons. Um, if I try, I can try to, to guess it right here and, and, and go like this and like, and continue here, here, and then I go here. And then I have this kind of sliver here. So it, it doesn't really make for a great user experience. They, even if they, they go up on the line like this, they might, um, still have some slivers. And, and so it doesn't really work well. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get, re, uh, remove those. Um, you're going to have users who are probably going to do something like this. They do an overlap, and this is clearly not right. You don't want to overlap two polygons, but you can, uh, you can test that feature that they're creating against the other one, say, does this overlap or does it intersect the other one? If it does, then I want to create the intersection or maybe the symmetric difference, just get where it doesn't overlap. Actually, no, I don't want ge uh, the difference. I just want to do the... Uh, operation to get the polygon that doesn't overlap. So when I finish, then it creates this uh, topologically correct boundary. There's no slivers. It's perfectly in line. So that's pretty cool. You know, um, 
And at the end of the session, I'm gonna show you the repo where I have all these demos. You can look at the code, you can use it for your own apps, you can do whatever you want. Um, so let's move on. So this is a 4X version of uh, editing, so I'm just gonna really quick, just add a mouse click, let's say I'm digitizing a line, so I'm not dealing with polygons anymore, but you know, I don't want to allow the user to create a self-intersecting line. So you can do a test against that line and one segment of the line and uh, make sure that the user can't continue. Right now I'm clicking, they can't continue, I'm double clicking, they can't finish it, but once it does pass the test, they can finish. So you can do functions like a lot like that. So you can also do overlay type analysis on the client. So here um, I'm working in say the state of Utah and I wanna know the percentage of the uh, sensitive land within 10 miles of my project point. Um, and so you can click and then test whether your buffer, well first I'm calculating a geodesic buffer, then I'm testing whether that buffer intersects any part of the sensitive land and if it does, I'm gonna union the land because despite the visualization and the symbology, there's actually a lot of different polygons there so I'm gonna union them all together, I'm gonna to cut it out and I'm gonna calculate the area and reflect it in that pie chart. And I even configure it on a mouse move so you can see how um, responsive it is. With the more complex polygons, um, you're gonna see a little bit of uh, lag or maybe it, it, it freezes your app a little bit. So you just wanna keep that in mind when you're working on the, with the synchronous portion of the geometry engine. Also notice that once I go down to Arizona, I, I don't wanna care, I don't care about the, uh, the distance from that point. So I'm just gonna cut that out and not allow the user to, to calculate area down in Arizona. So again, some pretty cool things you can do with the geometry engine. So um, again, in the context of editing, let's say you're creating a, a polygon um, and you wanna test to make sure that it's correct, it's a simple polygon, meaning that um, it's, uh, it doesn't have self-intersecting uh, lines in there. So in that case, this is a good polygon, it has only one ring, but let's say I do something like this, cause you know, everybody makes mistakes, right? And they might make a polygon like that. And you test to see if it's simple and it's not. It has one ring, but it has these intersecting edges to it. If that might be a valid polygon in your editing workflow, it might not. If it's not, then you can just reject it, say start over. That's basically what I was doing with that line app where I wasn't even letting them finish the line yet. I'm like, you can't finish this until it passes the test. In this case, you can just reject it, but you might say, you know what, that is a valid polygon. Let's go ahead and simplify it. And so now there's four distinct rings. You see four triangles there and now it's created those four rings. Um, this is showing snapping using the nearest uh, vertices. So um, anywhere the mouse is moving, I wanna grab the nearest vertice along this uh, polygon. But you might wanna be a little more uh, flexible and allow it to have the nearest coordinate. So notice how it's not snapping to a vertice, it's now getting at the nearest coordinate along that line. So again, pretty cool. So, you can also measure. And so this demo is intended to be more educational about when you wanna use certain types of measurements. So like I said, there's geodesic and then there's planar measurements. Um, web Mercator is the projection for the web. It's all over the place. Uh, we have it, you know, all of our base maps are in Web Mercator. You look at the other APIs out there of our competitors, they use Web Mercator. But um, how many of you consider yourself geography people or are you just programmers? So who's like geographers here? So you probably look at this map and you cringe because it is an awful projection, right? It is, it is extremely distorted when you get away from the equator. Like Greenland is, is huge compared to Africa when it should be probably more the size of Mexico. And, and so you get this really distorted view of the earth. And the reason is, is because the earth is round. I know that's shocking, but it is round. And that's why we have geodesic measurements. So right now when I move my, I'm gonna make a click when I move my mouse, I'm gonna calculate both the geodesic length and the planar length, and then compare the two and show you the difference. So as I draw this line, you're gonna see um, 
the, from the first point to the current mouse position what, what each length is. Right now, I'm gonna finish the line, and it says that the planar length is um, almost 9,000 miles. But in reality, the shortest distance between those two points is under 4,000 miles. So it's a huge, huge difference uh, when you are in these distorted projections. So um, I'm actually calculating the, uh, that uh, geodesic line there using the geometry engine as well, that geodesic densify um, tool or function to show you what that shortest path actually looks like. Although I'm actually passing that red line into both functions, I get the correct measurement from the geodesic. And then notice that as I get closer to the uh, equator, my percent error gets lower and lower to the point where if I click, I probably won't be exactly on the equator, but I can draw a pretty long line, and both those lines are only 0.2 miles different in their length. So um, you can use a planar length uh, measurement um, in this projection, but it only really works on the equator. So I know a lot of you are probably asking, well, why in the world do you even provide that option if it only works in one spot on that projection? And the answer is because we do use other projections, right? There are other map projections out there. There's UTM, there's State Plane, and there's, there's a bunch of others. Those projections are meant to minimize distortion within the areas that they represent the world. Um, and so what's, what's going on is that when we talk about map projections and uh, and flat 2D maps, um, we almost assume that the world is flat. It, it kind of, you're, you're trying to create a 3D um, object and, and, and make it flat. And so these measurements, the planar measurement is, is gonna assume a flat surface. When we're working in state plane, as long as you are within the uh, area of that projection, then, um, then the, the measurement will be good. And I think I actually have, uh, see if I'm gonna shoot myself in the foot here and it's not there. Oh, it is there, but I don't know if the data is still there. <laughs> but, uh, or there might be a UTM that works. Yeah, maybe not. But anyway, I have other demos in there. Oh, here we go. So let's go ahead and calculate um, the length here. And so you get the um, planar length and it's actually pretty good when, it, when you're within the zone of the UTM zone. So then um, there's also buffering, and again, you have planar and geodesic buffers. Um, years ago, uh, a major newspaper published a, a bad map where they were talking about missile ranges, and this app um, is kind of is here to demonstrate uh, what was going on there. So they published a map that uh, basically showed missile ranges from North Korea and the missile type that had the furthest distance. And it looked like that, which is extremely inaccurate because they used a planar buffer um, to measure from that point, which again assumes a flat surface, and we all know that the Earth is not flat. So someone who might read this, oops, let me put that back there on North Korea, and let's go into pan mode. and. So someone who's reading that paper in these major Australian cities, say if Brisbane or Sydney might be like, oh, well, it might hit pretty close to us, but we should be good, right? Wrong, right? Because um, the people in Brisbane will see that the geodesic buffer actually shows that it will cover their area. And you'll get a, a sense of what that buffer should look like on a, on a flat map like that. So again, uh, when you're dealing with kind of this Web Mercator projection, Web Mercator or WGS84, you're always, always, always going to want to use the geodesic functions if you're measuring or buffering. And in the 4.0 API, you get a sense of uh, what those buffers look like. So in the non-geodesic version, they actually um, they they look more distorted, but once you make it geodesic, they turn into perfect circles. So it's the opposite look of what you see on a flat map. If I were to buffer this um, up here, um, it, in the other one it had that, you know, that curvature line. And here's another app I, I wrote just a month ago or so where I'm requesting the position of the International Space Station. And on every second I'm plotting that position and I'm calculating the approximate speed 
based using geometry engine. So I'm, I'm measuring the line on each uh, request, and then I'm using the time it took to get the request to, to get an approximate speed. It's not exact. I think the actual speed is seven kilometers per second, so it's not, not totally accurate. But it's just giving you ideas of what you can do with the geometry engine. And I'm also making that curve using a geodesic line. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Dave, who is going to um, talk about other things. Right. Okay. So um, I've been looking at those demos, and you're probably thinking, I can do, I could, I've been able to do all of these kind of functions for quite a long time. We've had the geometry service in the API for probably about eight, eight years. Um, but what's really been different about these demos is, that, is, there, is the user interaction, is the, is the user experience of them. And when you look at why the user experience is how it is, when you look at sort of the geometry service, um, when, when we use the geometry service, the API will take the geometry JSON and sort of encode it into JSON. It will then send it over the network where it will get to the server. Um, the server will run the operation, um, package up the result as JSON, send it back where it will be decoded. Now, the timing at the bottom is completely made up. I've got absolutely no idea how long those operations will take because there's so many different variables involved. How big is the JSON that you're encoding? How good is your network that you're going to send either this small um, set of data or large set of data over? When you hit the server, that server is going to be uh, running several operations at once. I know we have Elastic Clouds and it, we can scale out, but realistically, there's going to be several operations going through that server at once. And then we've got the same network latency going back um, before finally being decoded. So that really sort of kills user experience. You're looking at sort of wanting to get sort of under 300 milliseconds to get a really good experience for, for users doing things. And if you sort of compare that to the geometry engine, the geometry engine doesn't have any of those hurdles. It's literally going straight from the, from the geometry object into the code and performing the operation. So I'm, I'm going to take one of um, Christian's demos and sort of show what that kind of means. So here, if I, if I, oh, select a field first. If I start, and do you see in the bottom corner, it's beginning to show how many, oh, we've lost me. Um, two seconds. Whoa. I can't see it now. Um, <laughs> two seconds. Um, yeah. So what you're seeing there is, um, there we go. So if you, as, as, the, as you go backwards and forwards, you're just literally seeing the number of operations that would be, have been fired against the REST service. So, um, you know, literally, I think you're probably up to 1,000 now. I can't actually see the number. Um, 3,000. So that, that, that kind of interactivity is just not possible. So if I um, go back to my slide deck. So now I now sort of want to sort of change tack a bit and go into how you actually write and use the geometry engine. So first of all, the geometry engine is just, um, it's just an AMD module, like any other module in the JavaScript API. It's available both as a four um, module and a three module. So you load it in, and you get, um, you get the module, and it's got lots of singleton methods on it, like buffer. And it, I mean, in this example, you literally call the buffer method, pass in a point, pass in a distance, um, pass in a, a type of unit, and you get the result back. Now, what we did with the Geometry Engine is we looked at all of the other APIs and SDKs, and we wanted to really get a consistent feel of those same methods across the APIs. There are some differences between the different APIs, but that's what we've been trying to do with, it, with the, with the um, interface. And just as a sort of comparison, this is the same code for calling the Geometry Service. And you can see that there's a lot more code involved. Um, you have to, you have to construct, you have to First of all, create the geometry service, create the buffer parameters, send them, and then you have to um, wait for the callback to get the result back. Um, so 
using the geometry engine really simplifies your code. There's a lot less code that you have to write. However, it's worth noting that there's a lot more code running in your browser. The geometry engine is a large, mod large module that's been brought down into your code. Another thing to say about the geometry service is it does have more operation, so there are more things you can do with the geometry service itself. So um, now I'm going to sort of build an editing app, but I'm going to have to get my computer working. So as there's no way I can do this sort of leaning over there. Um, so, yeah. Which one is it? Um, Okay, that's good. <laughs> right. So, um, one of the most common things that um, people are asked to do with sort of the JavaScript API is to build editing apps. And so, I'm just going to show a simple editing app um, and just show how the interactivity just gives you that slightly better experience. So, I'm first of all going to create a new feature. It's not using the geometry engine here. And I'm going to create, um, I'm now going to append to it. And you see that happened instantly. There was no lag whilst it went to the geometry service. It just happened straight away. And I can subtract from it. I can split it. And I can also merge the two things back together again. So, you know, those operations were really fast, really quick. There was no, no, no kind of user experience. And in a minute, I'm going to show you the code for those just to show how simple they've been to kind of write. You can also do effects. So you can start spinning things really quickly in the user interface. Now, I'm going to get this wrong because I always get it wrong. I, the number of zeros that I'm going to grow that by. I've either taken over the world. Nope, I've got it right this time. But you can also start using buffer. So you can buffer things. And you can do negative buffers to shrink things again. So you've got some, again, nice interaction, but all happening very quickly in the user interface. And lastly, you can start thinking about other things you can do with things like offsetting. So here, I'm going to start creating a new feature. But as I digitize the line, I'm doing measurements. And I'm also creating an offset distance as I go, as I go around. So you get quite a lot of nice user experiences that you can add to your editing applications. If I look at the code for this, now I have to say this isn't actually written in JavaScript, it's written in TypeScript, and that's why there's quite as many files as there are. Um, but if I go and look at some of the operations that I've been writing there, if we look at the append operation and go down, all that's happening here is it's using the drawing manager, and when they finish drawing, it literally unions the geometry with the, the current selected feature sets the geometry of the, to the new geometry, and then applies those edits. So in that sort of um, appending to a feature is in three lines of code. And the same is true of things like the merge. The merge is slightly different. It has to get all, most of the code here is getting all the other features that you've selected and getting their geometry and putting them into an array. But then I literally get called one method to union all the geometries in one go. So really clean, really simple to write. Um, if I go back to the PowerPoint deck now. So actually, I'll pass over to Christian to sort of show how to build some of the analysis apps that you can do. Um, so the, the demo I'm going to show um, is going gonna, is gonna to show a little bit of analysis, but it, it's mainly a visualization type of a sample. Um, because I focus a lot on visualization when it comes to the API and the rendering, I want to know I wanted to see what I can do with Geometry Engine when it comes to visualization. Last year when we did this session, I showed how you could use a stream layer and then calculate a buffer around, say, coffee shops. And then when a bus, a, a feature from the stream layer of a bus passed through that buffer, um, you could symbolize it with the render and like, make that symbol grow. Um, I'm not going to do that app this year. Instead, I'm going to show this other one that I'm, I'm excited about. So this is using the 4.3 API. And what I'm doing is I'm visualizing this data that I geo-enriched from ArcGIS Online. So this is Mexican municipalities, and I geo-enriched it with education data. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, OK, sorry. I geo-enriched it with uh, education data. And uh, I found a lot of these variables very interesting. Um, and this one I thought was interesting. 
they actually have attainment variables. So they say, this is the number of people in this feature that uh, you know, completed elementary school and didn't go any further. This is the number of people who completed uh, secondary education and didn't go any further, high school and college and so on. They also had a field that said, this is the number of people who did not go to any school at all, no formal education. And so I took that and I normalized it and I got the percentage of the population that did not have formal education. I got this map and I thought it was interesting. And it was interesting uh, for a couple of reasons. One is um, it's seeing those patterns uh, were, were quite striking to me. Um, and it made me think of uh, Tobler's First Law of Geography in which uh, states that um, all, everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than things that are further apart. And why I, the reason I thought of that was because I saw this, this area up here where it was very dark. There's a lot of people who did not go to school. Then it neighbors these other features where apparently a lot of people did go to school or did some kind of education. And then... Um, and there's, you see sort of a gradual fade out from, from down here where there's a big pocket of people who did not attend school. And it fades out gradually up to the north of where people did attend, more, more people did attend school. And that's kind of what you expect if you, you know, hold true to that law. And so I wanted to create a renderer that showed the features that break that law, so to speak. The features where, that are most different from their neighbors using this variable. So I actually used the worker framework um, because this um, sample does a lot of processing and then I brought in the geometry engine and I wanted to what I want to iterate through each feature and compare it with all the other features in the layer and so in essence I'm taking this feature and I want to check to see if it touches a, the, another feature and if it does and if it's not the same feature then I'm going to grab keep that feature grab the values and then I'm going to calculate an average of those values and calculate a difference and this is the renderer I get back. And this is, it's pretty washed out. There's not a whole lot you can see, and that's which, what I expect, because I, I expect to see areas um, that are similar to their neighbors, because that's, that's what the first law of geography is, that that tends to be what happens. Um, if you look at the legend, you'll see that um, I'm visualizing the, the features that are more different with a, with a shade of color than their neighbors. If they're, um, exactly similar, the averages are very close to each other, or they're within a standard deviation on either side, I'm just going to make them white. So what exactly is this map telling me? If I go up here, this deep blue feature, what that tells me is that the percentage of people who did not go to school is a lot higher than all of these others one, other ones that surround it. So high, in fact, that on average, it is higher that by uh, 27 percentage points, which is huge. Can you imagine doing something like this with crime or with like election data? Um, it might make for some fascinating maps. If you go down here to the south, you see some features that are red, which means that they're doing better so, uh, than their neighbors. So the, this feature is actually, uh, it says that there's a lot fewer people than its neighbors that uh, did not go to school. So they're doing better than their neighbors. But that's not really telling the whole story, is it? I mean, how, is it, how, are these how are the people in these features actually doing? So we can add that original variable back in using another visual variable of size, and we get this type of render. So this is um, more interesting to me. So I'll go back down here where I get, I see a bunch of color and I see a bunch of big circles. So what, what's going on here? What I see here is I see these same red features, and it says, and what they say is like, oh, we're, we're doing a lot better than our neighbors. We must be doing good, right? And the answer I would say is no, you're not doing right, doing so hot because the size, based on the size of, of the marker, you're still got a lot of people, probably as much as 25% of the population in that feature that did not go to school. So on a whole, you're not doing so well, but when you compare yourself to your neighbors, yeah, you're doing better. So really what, what might be interesting is these areas where there's a big blue circle, that means we're not, we're, we've got a lot of people who did not go to school, and in fact, a lot of our neighbors are very, very different from me. So I'm doing something wrong, I don't know what's going on there. And then down here, you'll see a couple of spots that are interesting where they have a tiny red circle, that, which means 
their neighbors are not doing very well. Like the, the population of those uh, features, there's a high percentage that did not go to school. But in this one, there's a very low percentage. And so it's, it, it's, there's something different going on there. They're doing something right when it comes to um, ensuring that the population is, attends uh, education. So these are um, some things you can do with, uh, with the geometry engine. I can actually um, open this up in uh, my uh, code editor and uh, show you where that's happening. So I, I'm using the worker framework. So this is the, the, the module I pass into the worker. And if I do a search here for uh, geometry engine, you'll see that when I'm iterating through these features, all I want to get back are the features that intersect. And basically, it's the features that touch the border of those uh, of, of its neighbors. And then I, I want to ensure that it's not the same feature, because I don't want to compare it against itself. So you can create some pretty cool visualizations and analysis apps on the client using workers and geometry engine. So I'm going to go ahead and pass back to Dave. OK, okay so. Um so far, we've been mainly concentrating on the geometry engine as just, um, as just the synchronous version of the geometry engine. But as we said at the beginning, there's an asynchronous version of the geometry engine. So you've actually, you actually get two different modules. And the asynchronous uh, version is different in that it uses web workers to perform the ge geometry operations um, um, that it's going to do. So it's slightly different from um, the example uh, Christian just did there, where he put the whole work the, all of the work of creating that renderer into a worker, um, but use the geometry engine synchronously. What we have with the asynchronous geometry engine is the ability for you just to call it and for those operations to be pushed to a web worker, and you'll get a promise back that will eventually resolve with the, with the, with the result. The advantage of that is that the UI is not blocked whilst you're running it. So if you're dealing with really big geometries, you will get a hit in the UI thread um, because it's doing all of the maths of the, of the geometry operation. You can also run many operations in parallel, so you can get a sort of a greater throughput of, op of operations going through it. It also makes it quite easy to substitute the geometry service code because it's such a similar pattern, um, because it is based almost like on a callback kind of process. The drawback is that there are some older browsers that do not support web workers. However, in reality, all modern browsers do support web workers. So um, how you use the geometry service is, 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 sorry, the geometry, asynchronous geometry engine is nearly identical. You AMD load the module in, and that module has all the same methods with exactly the same names. The only difference is, is that instead of returning the result, they return you a promise. So I'm going to give you an example now of, you, of, of, run it, of running that, um, of using the asynchronous one. So. On the screen here, you've got um, 500 points, and I'm going to buffer all of those points by 500 meters. Um, and what we've also got on the other side is the geometry service. So I'm going to um, start that off. And so now what's happening is, is all 500 points are being taken and passed to the either asynchronous geometry engine. Sorry? Oh, is it not? It drew a little weird. This one. There you go. OK. <laughs> um, it, 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 it ran, the, uh, it ran the methods um, and buffered the features. Now, that took 2.5 seconds to do all 500 points. That took, so to pass them across to the web workers, for them all to be processed, and to get the results back. And you compare that with the geometry service that took 28 seconds. So you can see that you're getting much more throughput. You're not blocking, blocking the UI thread, but you're still faster than going off to the geometry service and having that network latency. So I'm now going to go a bit into the internals of the geometry engine and sort of ask the question, what is the, sorry, you um, got a question? Um, should we, uh, we, we, we can do them at the end. Uh, oh, well, no, do you want to ask the question now? So, um, that's a, that's a slightly difficult question to answer because obviously we're constantly fixing anything wrong that we find in the geometry engine. So there's versions of the geometry service and there's fixes that go into that. And we try and keep all the fixes in, in parallel as much as possible and keep... 
then yes, yeah, the, yeah, they're the same. We 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 they we there's the, the, the same. The logic team. is the same in the two. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. That's good. Okay, I'm I'm still on the slide. Okay, so um, yeah, we thought we'd go into the sort of the internals of the geometry and ask the question, answer the question, what is the geometry engine actually doing for me? And one of the sort of um, important things about the geometry engine is that it's taking into account spatial to tolerance, um, and that's the spatial tolerance of the coordinate system. The sort of and what that is is it's the x y resolution the, where two points should for all intents and purposes be considered the same. So when they're so close together um, that they're actually the same point. And different coordinate systems have different um, sort of XY tolerances. And if you look at the segments on, this, on at the top there, you can see those two points. To the geometry engine, the two points in the middle are on the same point. And that's really important. That happens across the ArcGIS platform, everywhere where we, you, you use the geometry engine, it will be clustering points together where they're not where they're kind of indistinguishable from each other. And that can lead to them some odd results, but are actually results that are working for you. So here, I've got two points with, which are infinitesimally different. But to the geometry engine, when you call the equals function, they are exactly the same point. Because in the spatial reference that you're working in, there is absolutely no difference between the two. Another thing, sort of part of the internals of the geometry engine, is we demoed the sort of asynchronous geometry engine. Now, what we don't do is create 500 web workers when you call the geometry engine 500 times. What we have is a queuing system. So what we start off with is just one web worker, and if the queue starts filling up, we will create another one and another one and another one, up to about, I, I can't actually remember the number, it's between four and eight. But what we're preventing from happening is we're not going to um, swamp your browser. We're not going to create hundreds of web workers. And so what happens is the operations get queued. As soon as a, um, a web worker becomes available, the, the sort of method goes on to there. It gets um, resolved. And then it, um, it gets freed up again. And the, you get the result back again. So it's just worth knowing that you won't be able to swamp the asynchronous um, sort of method, but you need to take into account that it will take longer if the more operations you put onto it. Another thing about the internals is um, there is no project method in the geometry engine. So that's one method that we haven't implemented. And that has, um, that means that when you use things like the geodesic area, length and buffer, it will only work if your coordinates are in a geographic coordinate system. We have one exception to that. We have coded a specific um, transformation for Web Mercator. So you can use um, Web Mercator coordinates and have those methods work. But for other methods, um, for other projections, you will not be able to use those, those particular functions. Um, However, saying that, and you, you saw the earlier demo, that when you're using a projected coordinate system, they've usually been optimized to minimize the distortion in the area that you're working. So when you're using the planar sort of length and area methods the, and buffer methods, the actual accuracy should be quite good in the projection that you're working in. So another question we get asked quite a lot is when should we use the geometry engine? And the answer is not always. There are very sort of definite reasons why you might want to use it and reasons why you shouldn't use it. And it's really all about trade-offs. You know, the geometry engine is a large module of code that you're going to be bringing down to your browser. And if you're only going to call it once, you might as well use the geometry service. So I wouldn't always bring the geometry engine code into your, into your software. Um, there's other reasons why you might not want to use it. It doesn't support projections you might be needing lots of projection support, in which case, carry on using the geometry service. But if you need that interactivity, that frequency of calls, it's a really good route through to making your applications really have a good user experience. Another reason is the network connection. You might, have, you might be working offline, or you might be having very, a very poor network connection. And again, having that user experience is hugely improved. Um, and the last thing is the ease of coding. It's a much simpler API to kind of call the methods from. So I'm going to pass back to Christian. All right, we're going to go ahead and uh, close up. And before we do, I, and open up for questions, I just want to point out that we have a lot of resources for working with the geometry engine. Um, 
we've done our best to uh, write good documentation for it in uh, both the 3 and 4x APIs. I think the documentation in 4x is a little better. So um, if, you're, if you're looking for more code snippets and things of that nature, I'd go to 4x and again, the, the APIs are the same between the two, so I would favor the 4x. I also wrote a blog series about this a couple years ago, um, and I link to those blogs. Um, let's go to in, inside the documentation. So if you look at Geometry Engine documentation, you'll see links to each of those blogs there where I go through each of those three groups of functions, and then you'll see the documentation here. Try to make it thorough with lots of code snippets, and, uh, and there. And then um, you have access to all these samples that we demoed today. This is my uh, repo for my Dev Summit presentations this year. Um, this one is called Geometry Engine. So if you go into that directory, um, I didn't update the, the demos uh, summaries here, but you will see that they are there in the demos folder. So go ahead, take a look at the repo, um, use that code, and, uh, and make cool apps with it. We're excited to see what you can do with it. Some of you already showed what you've done with the Geometry Engine. I think it's exciting and, and keep doing it. So we're going to go ahead and open up for questions. And uh, oh, we also want to encourage you to, um, to rate this session um, using the events app. Um, so go and tell, give us feedback uh, how we did as presenters, if the content was appropriate for your needs, and, uh, and we'd appreciate to hear from you. So uh, we're going to go ahead and open it up for questions. You, okay, so the question was, um, can you or can't you use this with a 3D scene? Um, you can use the geometry engine in 3D, but only for 2D geometries. So you can't pass in a 3D geometry and get like a 3D buffer. So, yes. So what the question is the roadmap of the project function. So uh, we're actually, uh, I think by design, where it's like a separate projection engine module. Is that yeah. correct? So yeah. So we've got some active research going into looking into um, providing that module. We don't have a time scale for it, I'm afraid. But we are, you know, we are actively looking at that as a research project. How to bring across the full projection engine? Yeah, there's active development and prototyping for it right now. Um, testing going on. Because of the size of that potential projection engine, um, there, we probably wouldn't be bringing down every available projection that we support in the API. Again, because it, yeah. th that's just a lot of But as I say, it's still, it's still a research project. It's still project. a research project, a work in progress. Yeah. Sorry. Here and then there. And so the question is, can you save the features since it's run on the, on the client side? So um, yes. yes. The, the editing application that I was writing there was calling apply edits against the feature service. So it was setting the geometry and, and saving them in the feature service. So that's part of the API. And it's just been introduced in 4. There's now apply edits on the version 4 of the API. So the question is, is there any plan to do it with the parent service? Um, not currently. Uh, there isn't a, a plan for uh, making the print service uh, client side. Um, I am very interested in working with analysis widgets and seeing if we can um, make those like client side functions using web workers. Again, that's we've largely unexplored that territory at this point, but it, it is something we're thinking about and and you know, starting to prototype, but not specifically with print yet. And over here. Um, I, we haven't done specific um, benchmarking apart from, we, we've been benchmarking it as we've gone along to try and make it faster and faster and faster as we've implemented it. Um, I think but some, ben some benchmarking might have been done with the, with the full geometry engine in the sort of Java and, and C++ implementations, but I don't have those, I don't have those details. So, you know, obviously there's different implementations and different, different um, languages and so forth that it's been implemented in. So I don't, I don't have those details, I'm afraid. Oh, over here. Have you 
Um, um, you know, I personally have not um, tried using it um, with the JavaScript API in a mobile browser. Um, like like okay. Dave was saying, you can use it in the runtime yeah, SDKs. So, so um, you know, <laughs> mobile browsers is a very open uh, open question. You know, you can run JavaScript websites on an iPad, and the geometry engine will work fine. You can run, probably you can run it on an iPhone, but you know, obviously, as you get back older in time. Browsers um, become less modern. The phones become more resource constrained. So it really is a, a spectrum that depends on the capabilities of your device. Um, if mobile is a, a platform that you're planning on on targeting, um, I mean, give serious consideration to using the sort of runtimes or the the cross-platform runtimes run like Qt. All of those have the geometry engine in as well, um, and you you know they've got the geometry engine in available to you in. Um, C sharp in Java um, and so forth. So, so that, those, that's a good development route for you if you find that this doesn't perform on the browsers, on the mobile devices that you're that you're using. I will say that we all that we will be testing that to some degree. We are um, we are working on the development of the draw tools for the Forex API this year, and um, I am prototyping. Uh, ways to use a geometry engine in those draw tools, like setting up those topology rules, for example, that self-intersecting line. And uh, we are looking at uh, the uh, events for mobile devices, like touch instead of click and things like that. So <laughs> it will be tested in those environments for drawing. Um, but uh, it, so in that sense, yeah, that, that will come up, but we haven't done it extensively yet. But okay. There was someone else, I think, that had a hand up. Did you, was it you? So the question is, right? So currently, they're they're not using the GPU. Um, they're they're implemented in in pure JavaScript, but it's a really interesting space being using the GPU for that. And I know, you know, I'm sure that that teams within Esri are, are looking at everything that we can do in the GPU. So, but it's a, that's an interesting space. And you know, I've I've seen other research projects from other people in Esri where they've done some very interesting things in the GPU. So. Any other questions? All right. Thanks okay. for coming. Nice.